I have a basic laboratory at Mass General, and we really have two main focuses. And one is really studying lymphatic vessels themselves and how they grow, mature, and function with an interest in the role they play in a variety of disease processes, of course, including lymphedema. In the other part of my group, we do study lymphatic metastasis, and I won't have time to talk about that, but we really think about how cancer cells get to the lymph node and then really ask questions about when those cancer cells are in the lymph node, what do they do, do they drive disease progression, and do they have any um, immunological consequences? Um, so to do this in our lab, what we do is we use intervital microscopy, and so we take living animals and we'll put them right underneath the microscope. And this then allows us to both study normal physiology to put different loads and different conditions onto the system, and also study disease processes and follow these things longitudinally and even think about how they might respond to experimental therapeutics. So that sort of gives you a sense of what we do in our lab and where I come from with this perspective. And so what I was asked to do today was really talk about how the lymphatic system functions, how does it do its job, and then highlight some ways where it might go wrong that leads to the lymphedema. Um, and so... So oh, um, I have no conflicts to declare. And so I'm going to start with this image um, that we saw similar from Dr. Uh, Suwami. And of course, we now know that this isn't 100% accurate, but I'd still like this image because it highlights a few things about the lymphatic system. First, it tells us that there's different types of lymphatic vessels. You can see these small little root-like structures. These are the initial lymphatic vessels. And their main job is to absorb interstitial fluid and create lymph. These are connected to these larger lymphatic vessels. And these are your collecting lymphatic vessels. And their main job is just transport. They take that newly formed lymph and send it back to the central circulation where it re-enters the blood underneath the clavicles. The other thing I like about this image is that you can see that these collecting lymphatics seem to be pointed in a couple directions, underneath the arm and down into the pelvis. And that's because as this lymph fluid is returned, it does pass through lymph nodes. And so lymph nodes, of course, are the, the critical structures to developing adaptive immune responses. And what the lymphatic system does is essentially organizes that immune response. So what do I mean by that? We can imagine if I get a little infection in the tip of my finger, that needs to be detected by our lymphocytes. And without a lymphatic system, my lymphocytes are going to have to go constantly throughout my entire body sniffing every single cell to try and find an infection. And it's not just any lymphocyte, each lymphocyte is specific for antigen, and so it has to find the right lymphocyte to sniff the right cell. So it's a very inefficient process. So what the lymphatic system does, as it's collecting that interstitial fluid, it's picking up antigen and professional antigen presenting cells and bringing them to lymph nodes, where it essentially is concentrating all that signal down in your lymph node. So now my lymphocytes can just hop from node to node to node in sort of a target-rich environment and try and sniff around for the thing they're supposed to respond to. So thinking about those two main functions of the lymphatic system, there's actually a, th a third main one, which is absorbing dietary lipids. But for our conversation today, we'll focus on the absorption of interstitial fluid and this organization of the immune system. The functional consequences of dysfunction should be very obvious. We see it clinically as lymphedema, where we're not absorbing that interstitial fluid. And then we can also get locally immunocompromised states, which, again, in lymphedema patients are very common to get these skin and soft tissue so with that, then we have to think about how the lymphatic system actually does its job. And I'll start by looking at those initial lymphatic vessels. So these are those root-like structures, and their main job is to collect interstitial fluid. And they have some unique microarchitectural features that allow them to do that. First, when you look at the endothelial cells, these are the cells that line the vessel and make up the vessel, they overlap each other. Now, if you looked at a blood vessel, which also has endothelial cells, you'd see that their endothelial cells sit next to each other in a butt end-to-end -end and form these nice tight junctions. Well, lymphatic endothelial cells overlap each other. What's more is they have these structures called anchoring filaments, and these re really tether the cytoskeleton of the endothelial cell directly into the matrix. Essentially, it's gluing the abluminal surface of the cell directly into the matrix, except where the cells are overlapping. And what this creates, then, is this little valve and so if you have greater fluid pressure in your interstitium, it opens that valve and fluid can enter your lymphatic. If that pressure reverses, and the pressure is higher in the lumen, that valve gets shut closed. And now you've trapped the fluid inside. So really how we create lymph 
is through these oscillations and local pressures around these uh, initial lymphatic vessels. And those oscillations can come from muscle movement. It can come from a big artery pulsing nearby. But the concept is, is that these changes in pressure drive fluid in, and then it gets trapped. So that's how we can create lymph. Now, that lymph then has to get moved back to the central circulation, and that happens through our collecting lymphatic vessels. And we look at collecting lymphatic vessels, they also have some unique architectural features. First, they have these interluminal valves. And these are similar to what you might find in, in, in veins. And their main job is really to make sure the lymph is going in the right direction. Right? It's heading back toward lymph nodes in the central circulation. The other unique feature is that they're invested in a specialized muscle cell called the lymphatic muscle cell. And it's really a hybrid <laughs> cell between a cardiac myocyte and a vascular smooth muscle cell that you're seeing on this adjacent arterial. So the question is, why do lymphatics need muscle? We can understand it on the arterial. It's a high pressure system. The blood vasculature is a high pressure system, so the vessel needs structural integrity. We also know arterials can dilate, constrict to shunt blood flow in certain regions. But lymphatics are a low pressure system. So why do they need this muscle? Well, you have to think about what they have to do. As I'm standing here, I'm creating lymph in my lower legs and my feet. And that lymph has to get up against gravity. It has to get pushed through those, resist those lymph nodes and eventually repressurize to venous return pressure so it can re-enter the blood. And unlike the blood system, which has a nice central pump we call the heart beating to move the fluid around, lymphatics don't have a heart. And so it's the vessels themselves that have to do the work. And so these vessels contract, and they beat and pump to drive the lymph. And so this is an example of some of the intervital microscopy we do in my lab. Um, this is a technique developed by Sean Liao, and she was a postdoctoral fellow in my group. She now has her own lab is up, up at the University of Calgary. And this is really a demonstration of this in mouse. This has been known in larger animals and in people for a long time. But we did, were able to show this phenomenon in mouse, which then allows us to use lots of genetic tools and molecular tools to be able to try and understand how this works. And what are the molecular signals associated with it? The other th then thing to sort of adjust your thinking on collecting lymphatic vessels is that they're not just tubes, OK? And in conjunction, this pumping with these valves, for some reason my computer's slow, um, this pumping with these valves, they really form individual pumps. So you'll have a valve, a contractile unit, and then there'll be another valve upstream. And that forms a pump. We call that the lymphangion. And so really, a collecting lymphatic vessel is a whole bunch of these pumps all lined up in series. And so questions we think about, coming from a little bit of an engineering background, is how are all those pumps coordinated? Because you can't have two pumps working against each other, each other, otherwise all the flow will stop. And again, there's no central control in the system, so how are all those signals getting transmitted? And then from a physiological perspective, when we think about the loads of, on lymphatics in my legs, it's very different than when I raise my arm. And we know that when I raise my arm, the pumping stops, the vessels dilate, and the flow just drains passively by gravity. So how is that all coordinated? So these are some of the questions we're trying to ask to understand the normal physiology. And we use, again, combinations of mathematical modeling as well as our animal models. And I, don't, I won't get into a lot of this, but just give you a flavor of some of the work. Um, we've shown that calcium signaling, and others have also shown calcium signaling is very important to this. I mentioned that these lymphatic muscle cells are really hybrid cells between smooth muscle cells and cardiac cells. And similar to cardiac myocytes, which need calcium spikes and action potentials to generate that contractile force, these lymphatic muscle cells do as well. Nitric oxide is also a critical molecule in terms of being able to sustain these rhythmic contractions that I was shown. So you have to think about how that occurs, again, without a central control system to tell it, you know, contract, contract, contract. And so nitric oxide is an interesting molecule. It can be produced by the lymphatic endothelial cells in response to flow through them. But it also has a very short physiological half-life. So it disappears quickly. And so it's actually been measured by Dave Zabayas and Glenn Bolin that you actually get these little spikes in nitric oxide production along a contracting lymphatic vessel. And so we've shown with mathematical modeling that this combination of this on and off, this temporal dynamics of nitric oxide, along with the calcium signaling, can cause sustained contractions in the absence of any sort of external driving from a central nervous system. 
Some of the other things that we notice is that our view is always that when you get a contraction, you're going to get a valve closure somewhere. And it turns out that that's not true. Here's a trace of our lymphatic vessel wall, and you see the contractions. And I only put black arrows where we actually saw valve closures. So when we thought about that, that didn't really make sense to us. But we realized that we're just watching the, the wall move. We're actually not seeing flow. So I worked with a collaborator at Mass General named Ben Bakic, who's an expert in optical coherence tomography, which is an optical technique that he created to, or he used then to create a way to measure lymph flow. And so you can see in a lymphatic vessel here that has not been perturbed. There's no contrast injected. We're detecting these. And you can see this faint pulsatile activity we load up the system with more fluid, you can see these nice strong contractions, and you see that contracting. So we're measuring flow. We can look in cross-section at these vessels and see, watch the wall motion. And so we can see when they contract, and that's traced up here, as well as when you get these spikes in flow, and you can actually see it is the contraction driving the flow. So the other questions we ask when we start thinking about how this can get coordinated is we wanted to be able to measure multiple lymphangions in a row. So this is a technique where we're measuring, oh, this really got fouled up, um, sorry. Um, there's valves highlighted here and we're measuring in three different um, uh, lymphangions all at the same time. And when we start looking at the traces from this, we learned a few more things. And so three lymphangions with two sets of traces on each, the top in each pair is the area, so you're watching essentially the contraction of the wall, and here's your flow patterns. And so the first and second and third lymphangion, we see nice strong contractions in this first one, as noticed by the wall motion, corresponding to the peaks in flow. When we look at these other lymphangions, they're really not contracting. But the flow is getting transmitted through. And then we started looking at the valves and realized that over this five minute video, this valve stayed open except for this little spot when it closed once, and this valve was open the whole time. This is really telling us that these valves are open. They're biased open, and they're open and able to transmit flow through. And they only close when there's really a reason to close. When there really is an adverse pressure gradient pushing flow the wrong way, they close and prevent. So this is, we're starting to learn a little bit about how this system can be coordinated and function in a way, again, without that central control system. So of course, this is normal physiology. And what is this telling us about how potential ways lymphedema can be? Well, I've told you about these initial lymphatics and how they need to create lymph. If there's problems in your initial lymphatic system, either congenitally they don't form, or that we don't get that nice overlapping endothelial cells to allow the lymph to be created, you're not going to be able to absorb that interstitial fluid. So that's one area that we need to think about when we think about lymphedema. These collecting lymphatics. They have these interluminal valves. If they're absent, you can also have struggles to get fluid up against gravity. We need these lymphatic muscle cells. We need them to contract. We need to make sure that they're able to have their calcium dynamics, their nitric oxide response, in order to sustain it. So there's a whole bunch of different ways. And then, of course, we get the surgeons and radiation oncologists that come in. So lymphedema isn't just one cause. There are multiple, multiple causes and multiple ways to think about how lymphedema can start occurring. So one of the other things we study in my group, again, is the role of lymphatics in different disease processes. And of course, with lymphedema, very common to get these skin and soft tissue infections. And lymphedema patients get these recurrent patterns of these infections. But there were other classes of patients that had no known lymphatic dysfunction that were presenting with an SSTI. And they then developed these patterns of recurrent infections. And many of those patients actually went on to develop long-term lymphedema. So we were seeing this association between these infections and lymphatic, poor lymphatic function. And so we asked, what do bacterial infections do to our lymphatics? And so I had a former postdoc in my group um, who actually just started his own lab at Boston University last month, who got one of the more common bugs in the US causing these SSTIs, which is Staphylococcus aureus, and he got a methicillin resistant strain. And he, put them in our animal model. So the top movie is an uninfected animal, and I'll start the bottom one. And you can see that these bacterial infections basically shut down this lymphatic pump. Again, we're watching wall motion, what's going on with flow. So my friend Ben Vakic measured flow. Again, here's an uninfected animal. We're seeing this peaks in pulsatile flow, and that's lost after the infection and the velocity sitting at zero. So we have a phenotype. 
We don't see the contraction, we don't see flow. Moreover, this was a very sustained phenotype. It was basically a permanent impairment in this lymphatic contraction. And it was long after the bacteria had cleared. By day 30, if we try and find the bacteria with colony formation assays or try and PCR out genetic products, they're gone. Inflammation is resolved by about 60 days. But we're seeing this basically permanent impairment in lymphatic contraction. And so what was going on? So we started looking at those lymphatic muscle cells. And these are just two different ways to identify lymphatic muscle. And you can see that after bacterial infections, Lymphatic muscle cells were not covering the lymphatic vessels. They were disorganized, and their morphology was different. This is true four days, 30 days after infection, and now 260 days in this mouse model. And we measured flow for good measure out that long, and again, it was still impaired. So what's happening here? Bacteria seem to be killing off our lymphatic muscle cells, so we tested that hypothesis. We cultured out lymphatic muscle cells. We took supernatant from these bacterial cultures, put them on top, and this is just a cell viability assay, basically showing that the condition media is killing our lymphatic muscle cells. So what's in that media that's causing this? Well, not surprisingly, if you start looking in bacteria meeting, media, you find a lot of toxins made by bacteria. And for us, many of these were controlled by a single genetic element in the MRSA genome called the accessory gene regulator, the AGR. And we have a collaborator at the NIH who had MRSA strains that had this AGR eliminated, and when he gave them to us, and we infected our animals with this, and we did a lot of other work to show this, that these AGR mutant bugs weren't causing the shutdown in, in the pumping. So we know something, some toxin controlled by the AGR is basically causing the death of our lymphatic muscle cells and shutting down this pumping. And that then matches with the phenotype you see clinically in some of these patients, where as they get these infections, they develop these patterns of recurrent infections and long-term lymphedema, which is suggesting this poor lymphatic function. So obviously our goals moving forward are trying to understand which toxins the AGR are controlling to do this so we can target them or potentially target the AGR itself with the goals of trying to maintain pumping through a bacterial infection to help clear the infection, get that antigen and antigen presenting cells to that lymph node to start developing adaptive immune responses which are being shown to be more important in these infectious uh, cases as well as then potentially prevent that long-term. So I think I'm pretty much out of time, so I just want to thank people that did the work. Really, this work was done by Dennis Jones. <laughs>